Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. You know what? Um, as, as I was preparing for this series, um, I know that for those that have been saved, those who have been walking with Christ for uh, any period of time, it's so easy for, for those type of people to get very comfortable with their Christian walk. It's so easy, I, trust me. It's easy to go with the mundane and, uh, and just get comfortable because we've been saved for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But I, I, I prepared this message series for not only people that maybe you're far away from God, maybe, you know, church is foreign to you. Uh, you maybe didn't grow up in a house that talked about God or even shared the values of God. Uh, or maybe you're someone that's been sitting in a church or churches for many years and, um, and maybe you've lost touch. You lost the touch of, of the meaning, the true meaning of God's house. And so my desire is that, um, is that I bring a little bit more meaning to the reason that we come here together corporately. I mean, if you think about it, I love the fact that God is the most relevant person than any person on planet Earth. I mean, he could have said, he could have said you know what, I can't wait for you to come to my kingdom. He could have said, I, I can't wait for you to come to my throne. But you know what he said? He said, I can't wait for you to come to my house. And you know why? Because house is a place that we can all comfortably come in and fit in regardless of what what walk of life you have. I mean, right now, maybe you're someone that just, man, I'm not sure if I believe in this, God. That's okay. You don't have to believe to belong here at Elevate Church. What matters is that you're coming to a place called church, which is like, I love what uh, um, one of the people said on video, I forgot who said it, but they said it. To me, I see going to to church as I'm actually going to see the Father at his house. And you know what? Just like every single one of you have a wonderful home that you do life in, you have a living room that you sit at every single week watching TV, I'm sure, uh, hanging out with your kids, hanging out with family, friends, and, and you commune together, and you, you chill together. And, and well, the same goes with God. When you come into this church, you're coming into God's living room. You're coming into God's kitchen. And sometimes you're coming into God's bedroom where he wants to have some serious conversation, right? When my kids were in trouble, I'd be like, come to my room. And we'd have a conversation. And, uh, and you know what? Obviously, sometimes the kids got a little spanking. And you know what? Sometimes God's children need a little spiritual spanking as well. And so the, the, the house of God is not meant for you to just to come and feel good every single day. I'm sure that none of you feel amazing 24-7 at your house, right? You got challenges. You got troubles. You got problems. But you know what's pretty awesome is that you can come to God's house and there's answers. There's answers in God's house. God's presence is definitely the best answer you can get when you're going through trials, when you're going through challenges. Like, for example, Maggie. Maggie's been going through cancer, and, uh, you know, she's been in and out, but uh, the, the reports were just horrible. And here you have Maggie here sitting at the front row doing church in God's house. You know, I love it. I love it. You know why? Because when you go through stuff in life, man, you best believe that you better not do it alone. You won't make it. If you try to do life alone, God did not create you to be a loner. God did not create this earth and people inside of it just because he was bored in heaven, had nothing better to do. God created you and I for the purpose of relationship. God loves family. And what better place than to do family life than to do it in a place called church? That's why I love David's heart. That's why he was known for a man after God's own heart. David said, I couldn't wait when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I mean, this is David. You know, this is a, a one bad warrior. There's no movie out there that could even, we sh- they should do a movie about David's life. My God, talk about action movie. That dude was action, suspense, thriller, romance, you name it. And, uh, and I love the fact that, that we, we can come to a place and worship like we did during, wasn't worship awesome today? Man, well, we can just worship him freely and literally, you may, listen, maybe you didn't hear the chains falling. That's okay, but God is ripping some chains off people without, without you maybe even knowing it. You know, chains of doubt, you know, chains of depression. Maybe you came in here feeling a little bit uneasy, but right now, you're just like, man, I don't know why I feel just, I feel good here. This is awesome. Well, let me tell you something. Beyond the environment, it's his presence that's in this house. 
That's what you're feeling. You're feeling the presence of God in your father's house. And if it was important to Jesus, it should be important to you. Check this out. Matthew 16, 18 says this. I will build my church. Everybody say that with me. I will build my church. This is in the red. It's in the blood. This is Jesus talking. Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build my father's house. I will build my church. I will build you. You know what? You're the church. It's not the four walls. It's not the building. It's not the buildings. It's you. You're the church. And God says, I build you up. Aren't you glad that he builds you up? He says, I will build my church and the gates of hates will not overcome it. In other words, he's saying, when I build something, man, and you're, and you're in communion with me, not even the devil can actually overcome you. Now, it's not that the enemy won't come and visit you because he will. He'll even ring the doorbell. You know it? And sometimes he's rude and he'll knock and maybe barge himself in. But guess what? But when Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against you, that is exactly what he meant by that. When you're building with me, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. No matter what comes at you. Look, Maggie, dealing with cancer. There's been plenty of people here that have dealt with cancer. I've dealt with cancer. And you know what? And we've seen so many wonderful testimonies of people that have overcome some serious sicknesses and challenges and, and trials and just stuff without the body, without the church, without the family. I'm telling you, I think most of us would have just thrown in the, the towel and said, okay, God, just take me home. I want to go to heaven already. No. God does not create loners. Are you hearing me? God created the house of God. But my question is this, especially to you people who have been saved for a while. Do you still have an awe and a, re and a respect and a reverence for God's house? Do you still honor his house? Man, or is it just the building that you walk in and go check out friends? You know, do you go to church because of friends? Or do you go to church because that's where you meet your Savior? Do you go to church because that's where you come into his presence? Do you go to church because that's the place where I'm going to get answers? Or do you just sit there and you listen to messages after messages after messages, and you're just waiting for that next really cool, you know, statement, that little, you know, tagline, whatever it is. But I, I, I say that we come to God's house for the purpose of saying, I'm in my father's house right now this moment. Do you still have that reverence where he says, come boldly to the throne of my grace? Come on, this is the throne right here. This is his throne, his house. Do you respect it? Do you honor it? Do you reverence it? Do you still feel the same way you first did? Do you remember when you first got saved and you first started going to church? You couldn't wait. Do you still have that same passion? Do you still, still have that same excitement? Come on, do you still believe in the local church? Or have you just become so saved that you're beyond the church now? Huh? This, this, is good. This, is, this is good for all of us to hear. Ephesians 3.10, look what God says. He says, his intent, whose intent? His, his intent was that now, everybody say now. The yeah. ahorita. Yeah, este momento. Right now. That's what he said. He said, it was my intent. God's saying, it was my intention. The church was not an accident, just like you weren't an accident. God had you in his intention before you were in your mother's womb, is what the Bible says. You're like, uh-uh, my mom, my mom and dad, they, they wanted me. Great, I'm glad that your mom and daddy wanted you, but guess what? You were in God's warehouse in heaven before you got into your mama. God already had it. He already had you in his intention God does things with intention. God doesn't do things vicariously. God doesn't try to figure it out, you know, here and there. God's not trying to figure things out. He knows. He says, I formed you in your mother's room. I know how many hairs are on your head, and they are all numbered. Today, ladies, when you combed your hair and lost one little string of hair, guess what? Your number on your head of hairs, God already subtracted it, and <laughs> glory to Jesus. And if you have no hair in your ball, don't worry about it. God knows about that too. <laughs> it's all good in the hood. You can do extensions now, I guess. He'll count those, I guess. I don't know. His intent was that now through the church. Let me say through the church. Who's the church? I'm sorry. Who's the church? Who's the church? Lift your hand if you're the church. You're the church, man. That's who, he died for you. He didn't die for buildings. Let's stop acting like I'm going to church. I'm going to a building where it's religious and spiritual, and we're going to do some spiritual things. Like, see. No, I'm going to my father's house. 
I'm going, where are you going? My father's house. Well, your father's house, man? I, I don't know he lived over there in New Hall. No, <laughs> no, not that father, bro. My heavenly father, the one who changes my life. Do you have that intention? He says, look, he says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made what? known. In other words, God's saying, hey, listen, at some point, you got to go from your comfortable couch, from just being an attender. Come on, just going to church here and there, being a holiday Christian. What's a holiday Christian? Easter bunnies and, you know, Christmas, what do you call those? I don't know. Y'all can come up with something. Elves, there you go, Christian elves. But, but you go to church and you just become a holiday Christian or you become a Christian that only goes to church when you're in trouble. Nothing wrong with that, but is that your intention? Is that, is that your, your conviction of, of the house of God? Like, do you only go to the house when you, when you feel like it? Do you, do you only go to the house when, when you're in trouble? Or, or do, you, do you treat the Father's house like, man, this, this is not only a place where I can find comfort. Because isn't, isn't it comfy to sit on a couch? It feels so good to just sit on your lazy boy and just relax and watch. That's what I do on Sundays. I, get, I come home exhausted, you know. But, but check this out. But come Monday, I got to get up off that couch. <laughs> come on, at some point, you can't just be sitting in the Father's house and be stuck, stuck with your past hurts and pain stuck stuck with events that that yes maybe they're valid but you're stuck there because you still can't get over forgiving so and so and you still can't move forward because of of such thing that happened or took place and and you're just sitting there every single week you're just trying to make yourself feel better but guess what god wants you to go from consumer to contributor he wants you to go from consumer Okay, nothing wrong with consumption, but aren't you glad that God created an exit valve for us? Can you imagine if all you did was just consume, 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 consume? Have you ever eaten so much that your stomach just hurt, right? And you're just like, I'm sorry for the illustration, but hey, it makes sense. It makes total sense. Well, guess what? Guess what? God wants you to go from consumer, from, from receiving Okay, receiving your healing, receiving your divine purpose, receiving peace, receiving whatever it is you need, an answer. But at some point, God says, okay, you know what? It's time to contribute. It's time to get involved. It's time to get connected. How do I do that? Well, get involved with the church. Get connected with the church. Don't just be dating. God's not looking for roommates in his house. God's looking for family members. God wants you to belong to his family. God doesn't want you to visit. God wants you to have the revelation and the understanding. Wait a minute. No, no. I belong to a house. I have a spiritual house where I get spiritually fed, where I find spiritual uh, uh, peace, where I find spiritual revelation and understanding about my why of life. Amen. At some point, you can't just keep going to church and just keep going to church and consume, 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 and then you never give back. Every single person that Jesus spent time with, and they were all sinners. None of them were well put together. If you look at the life of Jesus, read the New Testament. Everywhere, everywhere he went, he hung out with people that had Jesus issues. He hung out with people that had religion issues, that had faith issues. And he would hang out with these sinners of sinners, chief sinners. And, uh, and what was amazing was Jesus didn't just spend time with them just to look all cool and everything, like, yeah, man, I hang out with sinners, and we know we just chill, and they're like, what up, Jesus? You know, it, and, uh, and just for the sake of saying, I hang out with sinners. Jesus hung out with people that were far away from God with a divine purpose. You know what that divine purpose was? Was for them to draw closer to God. If you're just consuming your faith, and you're not going from consuming to distributing life, that's a problem. That's an issue. And we have to begin to address those issues. We come to church also to assess our life so that we can address our life in order for us to progress in our life. You must assess. When you come to the Father's house, it's assess time. You assess where you're at spiritually, where you're at with family. Come on, where are you at in, in your walk with God? Where are you? You assess, and then we got to address those areas. I know this isn't a popular message, but guess what? We're not looking for popularity. We're looking for truth. The truth will make you free. Uh, the truth brings joy. 
The truth brings deliverance. And so um, as, as I read these verses, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. And as I think about this, all I can think of is, wow, you know what? God said, you belong before you ever believed. In other words, so many times we think that when people come here, we're just waiting for them to believe. But guess what? You don't have to believe to belong here at Elevate Church. Why? Because before the foundations of this earth, you already belong to the Father. You just don't know it yet for those of you that maybe have been far away from God. Maybe you just haven't got that revelation. Maybe you haven't got that understanding. Or maybe you just had some bad representatives of Jesus where you work at. And you're like, I don't want to know that God. That's an angry God. That's a mean God. That's a disrespectful God (laughs) based on the person who maybe has not displayed to you the kind of Jesus that we want to show you. A Jesus that loves, a Jesus that forgives, a Jesus that redeems, a Jesus that restores. That's the God that we serve. But how do you see, how do you view the house of God? Come on, are you just sitting every week? Are you just hanging out every single week and you're just consume, consume, consume? And I know some people will be like, well, you know what? I'll just go find a church where I can just go in and go out. Well, you know what? You can do that, but guess what? One day you're going to give an account for your life. One day you're going to stand before God. And God's going to be like, okay, what would you do with the gift I gave you called life? Oh, God, I got a great job. It was awesome. I did my career. Man, I got a big old house. I got like five kids. Man, I, I, got, I got the car I've always dreamed of. God was so, God's going to be like, listen, that was the added blessing. Now let's talk about the life called gift that I gave you with purpose. Because you can't take cars, you can't take careers, you can't take diplomas to heaven. You could only take souls with you. You can't take anything else. Huh? Nothing. You can't take nothing with you. You could only take souls with you. You have to go from a tender to belonger. Let me see all my belongers in the house. Yeah. Come on. You can't just be attending a church. You've got to belong. You have to. You have to belong. Why? Jesus wants us to belong to a place called home. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17 and verse 19. It says, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away. Look at this. So he preached peace to those that were far away from God. But I love the fact that he doesn't leave the, 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 the seasoned Christians out of this picture. He says, and, and peace to those who were near. So God spoke peace to those who were far away, and he spoke peace to those who are near. Right now, some of you or most of you are probably near God. But you know what? Right now, you probably need some peace. And he says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And also members of his, members of his what? So check this out. You can't say, I believe in God's house, but then you're not ingrained in God's house. You're not connected with God's house. You're not involved in God's house. If you truly believe that, right, it's like love. You you all know this. Someone tells you, I love you. Well, those are just words. I want to see the action. Show me the money. (laughs) Right? Like, I want to show me that you love me. And everybody has a different love language. Some people, they, they, they feel like they're loved when their spouse buys them a gift. Or they feel loved when they give them words of encouragement. But we want action. Well, guess what? God wants action. He doesn't just want you this, to be this Christian that has all kinds of information, but you never have any transformation with that information. It needs to show fruit. God wants to see the growth and the maturity of your relationship with him. It can't just be the same old, same old. God wants change for all of us. But I'll tell you, it really starts with making sure that we're ingrained in the, in the house of God. In the household, he said, you are members of my household. You are members of my household. You are members of my household. I, it's funny because I have people that get upset about when I use the terminology members. Like, well, you know, I don't have to be a member to belong to your church. I'm like, uh, that's kind of weird, but you got membership at Sam's, uh, Costco, uh, gym. <laughs> but you got an issue with God saying you're a member of my household. <laughs> you're contradicting, bro, or sis. <laughs> There's a contradiction there. What do you mean? 
You see, I'll tell you why. Because the world has formed us and shaped us, that we're able to receive everything the world offers, but then God comes in the picture. Come on, your father comes in the picture. And because we have earthly daddy issues, we start having spiritually father issues too. And daddy's trying to talk to you. And I don't want to hear that. Walk out of this church. (laughs) Pastor said, I got to go to Elevate Life Track. Pastor said, I got to serve. I got to get involved. Listen, I didn't say that. I'm just repeating what the Father said. I'm just the messenger. Don't, don't, don't hate. Cooperate. Amen? Yeah, yeah it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> God wants our life. Listen, God wants our life to be poured out. God wants our life to be poured out. God, God, God filled you so that you can pour, pour out of you. God filled you with his love. God filled you with his spirit. God filled you with purpose. God filled you for the purpose of pouring out. For example, perfect example, there's a woman uh, in the Bible who who had some some sin issues, some very deep-rooted sin issues, and, uh, and the whole town knew her. She was a little bit off and stuff, and, and Jesus comes to a scene where she's at this well at 12 o'clock. If you read the original King James Version, it says at the 12, at the 12, o'clock, at 12 o'clock noon, she was by this well, and she's drawing water, which, first of all, if you even begin to study uh, uh, just the, the lifestyle of women, it would be off. You would be completely off, like something is, is spiritually... And, and something is wrong with you emotionally, like you're off. You should not be by the well at 12 o'clock noon. There's no need for a woman to be by the well. In other words, it said something like she was a very loose person, basically. And so Jesus is showing up at the scene. The disciples, they go out and they get food because they hadn't eaten for days. And then let's set this up real quick. Look at John chapter 4 because I'm sure every single one of us can relate to this message. And you'll see right now what I mean by this. It says in uh, John 4, verse 7 through 11, it says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Everybody say, draw water. water. Say it again. Okay, because here's the deal. We're all drawing from something or someone. So it says, and when the woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And his disciples had gone out into the town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, and this is what trips me out. I love reading the Bible because here you have a woman who knows she's deep in her stuff, man. This woman was going from relationship to relationship to relationship. And listen, men and women, we can all relate to this. You know, before you were married, relationship. Maybe right now you're single, relationship to relationship. And it's like you're just going from one person to the next person to the next person. And you're just not finding any fulfillment whatsoever. And so... This woman, all of a sudden, she goes religious on Jesus. Like, she goes from sinner to now she thinks she's got the spirit of, of like, I know it all. And look what she says to Jesus. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Samaritan woman how can you ask me for drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, which I found that funny. I'm like, girl, you got bigger problems than trying to talk to him about how we shouldn't be talking with each other. You're with some other dude's, uh, 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 some other uh, woman's dude. What do you mean? <laughs> now you're talking about we shouldn't be in association? It's so hilarious. Isn't it amazing how we're so good at hiding things, but God already knows your heart? Like, Jesus, I'm sure he just smirked. He didn't condemn her. That's what I love about God. God doesn't condemn you wherever you're at. He just smiles. Right? Like, like you can act like you're something in front of others, but God already knows what's inside you. Right? And so he just, so he keeps having a conversation. And verse 10, Jesus answered her and said, hey, listen, girl, if you only knew. Everybody say knew. New, new, new reflects or, 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 or symbolizes our intimacy if you only knew me he said if you only knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking you for a drink if you only knew that every single Sunday when you come here if you only knew that every message that's being spoken is really directly for you but if you only knew the gift if you only knew the gift do you still honor and reverence the fact that God's word is a gift to us If you only knew the gift, if you only knew the one who was speaking to you right now, if you knew him, man, you'd change your attitude about that. If you only knew that I was sitting next to you, man, I bet you wouldn't act that way. 
If you only knew that I go with you wherever you go, you probably wouldn't treat people like that. If you only knew, if you only really knew me, that I never excuse myself from your life so that you can do your thing. Don't hate. <laughs> if you only knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you to, for a drink, he says you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And she said, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. There it is. You have not, she looks at him, you got nothing. What, what can you give me? It's kind of like you trying to be a good, a good example of faith at your workplace or, or in your community. People look at you and they're like, man, you got nothing to draw with. How are you going to change my life? How's your faith going to change my life? Well, guess what? You don't, get, you don't get caught up in how can your faith change their life. You just get caught up in just showing them that there's something more for a thirsty soul that's seeking. There's something so much more. So anyways, um, and then she says this. Mrs. not interested, was really interested because then she said, where can you get this living water? Like, okay, I, I, I'm desperate. I, I, I know I've been... I've been not living right. So the conviction started hitting her in the message that Jesus was preaching in church service. And she kind of felt drawn to him and said, how, how do I get this living water? You see, that's what, that's what church does. It brings you to a place of conviction where you start asking the right questions instead of thinking about the wrong things. You start asking yourself. You begin to reflect with yourself like, man, how am I with my walk with God? How am I with my relationship with my family? How am I with, with, with my, my, my co Who am I right now? Where, what is my identity? Am I just lost? Am I confused? Am I just bound with stuff? Do I just keep dealing with the same? See, the church helps you not only expose those areas, not to shame you, but exposes, God exposes to heal you. He doesn't, he doesn't condemn. So he's so gentle with her, like, hey, girl. You know, so he's having this conversation, and he goes on to say to her in the same chapter, in verse number 13 and 14, look what he says to her. He said, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them, he will never thirst. She will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so the moral story of what Jesus was saying in this part of the Bible, and it's like the woman and many of us here in this church, we're always trying to fill our life that's filled with void with all kinds of things. This, this reflects every single one of us. Basically, Jesus is saying, girl... You came to the wrong well. That's really what he was saying to her. Like, girl, you keep coming back to the same, same well, 12 o'clock every day. You're doing the same old thing. You're with the same old dude, dudes. You're with the same old people. You're, you're with the same old tribe. Come on, but every time you leave, you're still thirsty. Listen, we've all been there. Far away from Christ or close to Christ. You're unsatisfied. You're unfulfilled. So what do we do? We start filling it with activity. Oh, I love hiking. I like skydiving. I like, and you start going dangerous sometimes. You start sewing, you know, because you can get poked with a needle, right? And so you, <laughs> and, and we're trying to, we're trying to fill it. Listen, we're trying to fill it with all kinds of things. This woman was filling it with relationship after relationship after relationship, but we're no different. So many of us, we start filling things with relationships after relationships and not realize that, listen, there is not one man or woman that can fulfill you. There's not one man or woman on earth that can fill your void and so we keep going to the same well of dysfunction and we keep trying to draw it out and we do draw it out and then we drink from that dysfunction we drink from that relationship we drink from whatever it is you know some of us were workaholics we just keep staying focused and and have a vision I'm and I'm like that I'm very driven so I have to guard that place in my life because I work hard but if not careful, I can start making my job my mistress. I can start making my work my, my outlet when God's saying, no, listen, that's not your outlet. That will never fulfill you, Mauricio. I'm the only one that can fill your thirsty soul. Amen. The only one. The only one. <laughs> so she just kept coming back to that well, trying to fulfill and fulfill that thirst, fulfill that thirst. And I believe that all of us at some point either now or maybe in your past, you have gone to the wrong well. Everybody say whale. whale. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. We've all, we've all been in that moment in our life. It's like, well, <laughs> there she goes again, dating that loser. Well, <laughs> there he goes again, starting that business with the wrong people. Well, <laughs> raise him. <laughs> there they go again with that same attitude. Well, <laughs> everybody say with me, well, well. that's what you do. That's what Jesus said. He said, well, you can keep drinking there or you can come to me and I'll fulfill you. And when I fulfill you, not only will I pour into you, I'll make you a spring of life. If you're a spring of, of living water, guess what? Now you're pouring out. <laughs> and it's so easy for us to come there. Nothing can satisfy the thirsty, longing soul but Jesus. Nothing. Nothing in this world can satisfy you. What did Jesus do for this woman? You know what he did? Jesus, Jesus filled her with love. He filled her with so much love. She went back into town, and she looked for all her boyfriend, all her men. She looked for Juan, Billy, <laughs> Chan, Jamal. Well, we're diverse, so we've got to talk like that. So she's like, she's like, we're breaking up. You and I, we are over. We're, we're done. I don't need you anymore. I found someone that fulfills all of my void. I found someone that actually values me for who I am and not what I can do. I actually found someone who cares about my well-being and the purpose and the divine plan that God has for my life. And you know what? You know what's funny about this story is that these four dudes, I just say four. It could have been five. I don't know. But they look at her and they're like, Girl, you lying. <laughs> you lying. I already, because I already know you. I know you. You've been with just about everybody. I, we know you. And you know, you know what they said? They said, show us. Show us this man. And they all go up the hill, right, to the well. And then Jesus, he begins to speak. So she literally gets rocked with a new life, new love, new hope, new purpose, new vision. And then you know what happens? She's so like just stirred in her heart what God did for her, that she pours it out on these people. They all come up. They go to church, Jesus. Jesus preaches a sermon to them, and they all said, we believe, not because of you, girl, but because of him. <laughs> you know, sometimes people are not going to believe in God because of you. But all you have to do is their one invitation away from knowing him. That's all God's saying to us. That's the church. The church is the hope of the world. Listen, you can do church how you want to do it, but you got to get back to the Bible. The Bible has already given us, uh, 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 I don't want to say laws, but I believe he's given us limitations that should govern our decisions at some point. They should govern us. They should, gov they should discipline us. And so we know the story. You know what? They all come, and it's, it's funny because, you know what? Here's what they all look like. You know, we all represent this cup. Can y'all see this? We all represent this cup, and the world is like Coca-Cola, right? It's, it's, it's sweet, right? It's addicting. It's very, I, I like Coke with lime in it, a lot of ice. So good, but, but it's so bad, isn't it? It's just, there's nothing good, but you know what? But the world will package it right. Man, they'll do commercials. They'll spend millions and millions of dollars for these commercials on Coca-Cola. And then you know what? What happens? They, they, know how to, they know how to touch the strings of your heart. And then we go buy a big old 12 case of Coca-Colas, right? You know, I'm telling you, we have all have done this before. We have all been trying to fill our void with alcohol, drugs, smoking. We have tried to fill our void with overworking, overeating. There's so many things that we've tried. And so you know what happens? So here's what the world does. It tells you, yeah, come, come for more, come for more. And we're just, we're just being poured into. But guess what? The destiny of this cup is to be empty for the rest of its life. That's the destiny of this cup. That's all the world does. And so the world just keeps filling you, filling you. are just like, hey, hey, hey. And you just keep drinking, and you're drinking out of an empty cup. But what does Jesus do? Jesus, aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't, doesn't you know, plug up your holes? Right? He, he doesn't do that. Jesus gives you a new cup. He says, I give you a whole new life. 
And he says, but when I fill you, here's what happens. I start filling you up, and guess what? You start retaining, and you start retaining. Then you start growing, and you keep growing, faith, spiritual walk. You start growing in love, forgiveness. And before you know it, you're so growing that, look, now you're being poured out, and 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 other people are also experiencing the outpouring of the spring that is in you called living water that you're able to bring to people every single day that you do life with Jesus every single day that's the church that's the church the question is I wonder which one you live Christian and non-Christian because both of them are in this pot and that's the reality but when you finally get the reverence of the house of God you'll think different why? Because there's a sense of like, God, you know, I know this is a building, but I know you dwell here. It's in scripture. I believe it, God. I believe what you're saying to me today. I believe you're speaking to me today. And so, listen, I'm not saying, when I say I heart my house, I'm not saying, hey, come love your pastor. I love my pastor. I'm not looking for that. I, I don't need, I honestly, I don't. Well, yes, love me, but I don't need you to, to like pet me up. I love you, pet. I don't need that. I don't want you to come here and say, oh, I, I love all the people I get to do life with. Yes, that's awesome. That is so great that you love doing life with people. And, and that's the added blessing. But you know what I want to get Elevate Church to? Where we say, no, I love my house because that's where I meet my Jesus. Can you imagine if all of us had that kind of kid? If every single person that walked in this room, can you imagine the miracles that can take place in this house? Can you imagine the healings that can take place just because of the spirit and the attitude of believers and even non-believers, people that are far away from God? People, people, people that are far away from God are going to say, man, that's the Jesus I want to know. You know, because I've been so used to being condemned by all kinds of people, my family, my workplace, and maybe even by some Christians, maybe even by some churches. I remember the first time I was an atheist, okay? I remember I got invited into a church this one time. This is when I was younger. I was probably about 16, 17 years old. I walked in the church, and at that time, I didn't look as fly as I did today. You know what I'm saying? I, I was just like baggy pants. and just I was a kid. I was a youth. I was lost in, in my identity and I walked in just looking like street thug and everybody's just like this just staring at me and I'm just, I just felt like they were undressing me. I, I felt like I was going through the, 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 the hall of shame and they were just staring me down and just looking at me from top to bottom not even greeting me, just kind of like pfft. you know, I mean this, is, this was the church I walked into and that's why more and more it validated the fact that there is no God. Because the God that people say that he loves, that's not the God that people reflect nowadays in church. Now I'm not saying you got a grace card now to go live in sin. But I'm saying that his love should compel you to stop sinning. His love should compel you to get your life right. At some point, his love has to still be real to you that it brings reverence back in your life. And you're like, man, you know what? I don't want to be right for her or for him. I want to be right for him because I answer to him. And so many of us here today, you may be hurt from a past experience. Maybe someone did you wrong and you're still waiting for those people to come and make it right with you. Well, guess what? You're going to wait a very long time because you know what? You don't need people to get right with you. You need to get right with God. That's all that matters. I can't answer for so-and-so who did something to me. I could only answer for me. So while you're still waiting for someone to come get it right with you, let that go. Let it go. I'm telling you, you're hampering your growth with God. You are hindering God's divine purpose that he wants to show you in his house. At some point, we have to grow up and say, God, I've done too much sitting. I'm ready to get engaged. Yeah, there's too many free agents in Christianity. There's too much performance in Christianity. There's too many auditions in Christianity. You're just trying to audition for God to show him how good you are. Let me tell you something, you're not good enough. The only reason you're good is because God is good. That's the only reason you're good. In your worst day, you're still good in the eyes of God. In your worst hour, 
in the midst of your darkest secret and your darkest sin, God loves you. But that love should compel you to change. And if it doesn't compel you, then, then you know where you're at. You're, you're denying the one who died for you on a cross. You're denying the, the reality that God gave you his body and he was broken so that you can be whole again. God wants to heal. God wants to, I get it. We all know it. We believe in processes and we do. We believe in process of healing here. There's a process. But guess what? I love process. I love structure. I love all that. But at the end of the day, Jesus is the healer. Go to counselors, go to therapy, do all that. You should. We promote it here. We believe in it, okay? I've gone to counseling. I've gone to, to therapists. For what reason? Just to be sound doing ministry. My God, ministry is brutal, but it's brutal. Full. You know, it's beautiful, but it's brutal, man. Oh, my God. People hate. People talk. People do some harsh things. But let me tell you something. But Jesus is my only healer. You can keep going to all the world and trying to find your fill here, your fill here, your fill here, and you'll still find yourself empty. You were created for God's divine purpose. You were never created to be a free agent, and you can't just keep doing what you want to do. At some point, you got to come back to God and say, here I am, Father. I'm coming back to my manufacturer, and his name is Jesus. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.